greetings from Apollo Hospitals. Today we are going to show the second live case of uh, TAVR. She is a, I mean, Can we get the slides? Yeah, please. Slides. Sudhakar yeah. will present the history. Here is a 81 year old lady, thin built and frail, uh, with weighing of 40, uh, 40 kg, uh, known hypertension and diabetic, presented with exertion of the angina and dyspnea uh, of Naiha function class 3 for the past 6 months with no history of orthopnea and PND. Next slide. The, co the combined p uh, weight of the two patients here is 75 <laughs> kilos, which is less than the average patient in New York. So. EC showed uh, LVH with uh, strain pattern. Next slide. 2D echo showing uh, severe uh, aortic stenosis with. Uh, uh, velocity of 4.9 uh, and uh, mean gradients of 96 and 52. Next slide. Next slide. Coronary angiogram showing proximal RCA, ma borderline lesion. Left system is normal. Next slide. Next slide. So on the CT scan, as we said in the earlier cases, this is the key for if you're doing TAVR. Whoever's uh, doing the case needs to understand what the anatomy looks like, needs to review the CT scan. So from a sizing perspective, uh, the annulus measuring just at the annular level, area where in some measurements 335, as high as 348. Uh, and the LVOT is, is, does not really change much. It's a pretty tubular structure. Next slide. It's again a bicuspid, which is the vast majority of cases that we see here. Um, it's left-right fusion. It's a type 1 bicuspid. There's a fair amount of calcium on the non-coronary cusp. As, in, as you see in bicuspids, the ca often the calcification is asymmetric. Here again, it's mostly on the non-coronary. The raphe is not that calcified, but has scattered calcium. But you see again, the leaflets are very thick. And, uh, at the STJ, uh, the, the diameters are around 25, 26. Next slide. Uh, the ascending aorta is somewhat dilated around four and relative to the patient's size it clearly is dilated. And again, you see the bicuspid nature. Our angle for deployment here was predicted to be a little bit of a caudal view. You'll see here we altered that a bit. I think when you get these CT scans, patients generally have their arms in the, in the, above their head. And when we pos position them on the table, their arms are not above their head. So there's some variability in terms of uh, the exact view from the CT scan. So you have to check and adjust it sometimes. Next slide. Uh, the coronary heights were a little bit low. Uh, left coronary, we got around 12, uh, but the STJ uh, was tall around 16. Uh, but the sinuses, you'll see in the next slide, please. Oh, we don't have it, sorry. The sinus width, which I'm sorry, was in the earlier slide, was around 26. Um, vascular access, next slide. Uh, arteries on the left, uh, very calcified common iliac and tortuous on the left. Uh, on the right, the, the vessels were a little less calcified. It was more straight. Vessel diameters around six and a half at the smallest and around seven in the common. So we elected to go on the right. Um, now, our plan today is to use a MyVal for Merrill. Uh, and, you know, again, I have some experience, but uh, not, not, a, not a ton, but it's a very similar to the Sapien 3 balloon expandable valve. Um, it's bovine pericardial leaflets on a cobalt chromium stent. Uh, you know, di slightly different from the Sapien 3. The sizing uh, is a little bit different. Uh, you know, with Sapien 3, we have 20, 23, 26, and 29. And one of the challenges with, with sizing has always been there's these gray zone sizing. And I think with MyVal, they've done uh, intermediate sizes. So they have a 21 and a half in addition to the 20 and 23, and a 24 and a half in addition to the 23 and 26. So these, the sizing is by one and a half uh, millimeter increments which sometimes, you know, choices, more choice is not great, but in this scenario, I think it is. And so, again, as we talked earlier with the bicuspid, we tend to size down. So with a Sapien 3, it would have been tough to take a 20 because there's not that much calcium, so we would have done a 23 but underdeployed. Uh, with the availability of intermediate sizing, uh, a 21 and a half has an area around 360, uh, and so it, with an area of 340, we're about 7 8% oversized with a 21 and a half. So our thought was to go with the 21 and a half. And there's always a trade-off of hemodynamics versus right size in the valve. And again, in this scenario, we thought a 21 and a half. And I actually called uh, Ravinder Rao. We called him just to get his opinion because he has a lot more experience with my valve. Uh, and he, he said also that he would do a 21 and a half. So Shail, uh, Vijay Iyer here. Do you want to uh, quickly walk through your choice of balloon expandable versus self-expanding, even in cases like this? I, I know economic considerations aside, how would you approach this if you had no? Uh... Sure. 
So I think one of the challenges that we look for, so you know, balloon expandable, what are the trade-offs? I think one of the advantages of balloon expandable, it's a very predictable deployment. Um, it is a, a lower pacemaker rate than we've seen with the self-expanding valves. But some of the, the trade-offs are in eccentric calcium and LVOT calcium potential risk. And if it's LVOT calcium, it's annual rupture. In a type one bicuspid, it's, if you have a calcified raffae, you may not fully expand. Here, although it's a type one, the raffae is not that calcified. So I don't have concerns about the balloon exp uh, expandable circularizing. Remember, a balloon expandable is sort of interannular. So if you don't circularize the valve and you have very heavy calcium, then you're gonna be elliptical and that's gonna really impact uh, not only your gradients potentially, but also durability, because you'll get leaflet mouth coaptation. Other considerations for balloon expandable versus self-expanding are valve height. The balloon expandable valves are much shorter. Um, uh, this uh, woman has a RCA disease, which we didn't discuss. You know, we were debating whether to fix it or not. She has no angina. She has a mean gradient of 50 across her aortic valve. So the feeling was to leave the RCA alone and, and do a, a balloon expandable. With balloon expandables in general, will land below the coronary, so access to that RCA, if we need to fix it in the future, or she develops angina, or we decide it needs to be fixed, would be a lot easier. So I think that's another consideration as well. Could you also talk briefly about the fact that this is a bicuspid valve, and your valve is probably going to end up in an eccentric position in the annulus and not completely in the middle, and concerns with low coronary height with the bicuspid? Absolutely. So what, that's a very valid point. We look at the CT scan. So if, you, if that raffe between the left and right is heavily calcified and dense, when you try to do a balloon expandable, you know that it's not going to expand in that direction because that raffe is going to act like a wall. So it's going to push everything to the non-coronary side. So you have to make sure there's enough room for this valve to sit just in that, in that area from the raffe to the wall. In this particular case, I do think that raffe is not that calcified. I think there'll be motion. It will be eccentric and be displaced probably towards the non-coronary, which is what we expect. Um, but there's enough room for, for it to sit. Um, you know, the, the scenarios are, so we had a case, we had a right non-fusion. and We had a short mobile left coronary cusp. We, uh, the hands there, yep. Uh, and what happened was, as we deployed the valve, it, it moved, it was displaced toward the left coronary. And although the sinuses were big, the entire valve was displaced and it occluded the left coronary because that short leaflet was uh, pushed over that way. In this case, it's going to be displaced through the no towards the non-coronary, if anything, and there's no issues of coronary obstruction there. One, one other case where we had you felt like that and then we took a little lesser sized valve to avoid aortic annular rupture because it doesn't expand that side, it expands totally this side. If we take a bigger valve, we could land in trouble. Correct. Other, other point, what we are generally bothered in India is uh, it depends upon the femoral artery sizes because my valve generally we are finding it challenging if the artery is less than 6.5, we can't do it. With other case, many of them because it's a uh, bigger fringe. Whereas it may not be a point with the Edwards, which is uh, equally okay, but that is the other deciding factor in our country to decide. I think we can proceed with the case, Sushil. Yes. So we've, similar to before, we'll go quickly through the images. Can we go forward on the images? So we got access on the left side with the A and V. Next slide. We got, uh, we crossed over. We did a shot. Uh, play the in angio. Uh, next slide. Uh, we put a pacemaker up. We looked for an annular view. This first shot, although it's bicuspid, you see that right coronary cusp even though it's fused, is a little bit high. So next shot, it's somewhat horizontal aorta. So we went a little bit more RAO, and now you see that the three cusps are lined up. So this is the view we're going to deploy in. In general, with all bicuspids, I uh, pre-dilate. Uh, we, we, uh, we cross the valve here with the Trumo. We, we, uh, next slide. Uh, and we, we got our, our, our Amplatz extra stiff wire in position. And we have a 16 millimeter balloon. My valve comes with either a 16 or a 20. I think 20 would be too aggressive here. Um, ideally, we'd do an 18, but we have a 16 uh, here, and they're working on more sizes as well. So we're going to go ahead and pre-dilate. We, we put the python sheath up. To help open up the python, we uh, use an 18 French dilator to expand. The python goes in small, but has some seams that expand as the valve goes in. And so we've, uh, uh, we put a dilator to expand that to make it easier. Okay. In this MyVal, other recommendation is you need to pre-dilate it always with the balloon. Sometimes you could avoid with Edwards and other valves, but here, because little bulky nature, so we're gonna be we ready always for dilating. I tell you when? Okay, go ahead, for cross. Okay, stop. Okay. Uh, we'll just do it on floor, we're not sitting. 
Okay. Just floor, okay. All right, pace her on. 180. 180. Okay, going up. Pace her off. Okay, good. Off floor. Can we store that, please? Studio. Rest is gone. No? So you see there, the, the pressure has come back. Good. Play. Oh, can you play that, please? Yeah, it expanded nicely. So we took a 21 and a half, and we added a CC and a half. So I guess the question is, uh, can, you hold, uh, hold, can you hold negative? Will I pull this out? Hold negative. Um, uh, we could have taken a 23, taken volume out. Here we elected to do, as I said, the 21 and a half and add volume. I don't know if there are people on the panel that have more experience uh, with this and what they would, what are their thoughts regarding sizing? We are always uh, worried of uh, producing bigger sizes, producing into trouble. So that's how I think uh, people are habituated to take a little less and you can expand it more if required. Yeah, I mean, I think in the, in the case if you were to do a sapien here, you would probably not be in that intermediate range. You'd have to take a smaller valve and expand end? it bigger or take a bigger valve and take a CC off. So Okay. So key aspect of any of these uh, uh, valves is to make sure orientation is correct. Because you obviously you don't, uh, I don't think we'll be able to show it to you, but um, the, you want to ensure that the skirt is, is facing towards the distal end because the skirt's going to be towards the ventricle. So here the orientation is correct. So before you put any of these uh, valves in, you've got to ensure orientation is correct. And we, in the US, we have a timeout procedure where two people have to confirm. So I will say orientation correct, and the next person says orientation confirmed because that would be a catastrophic error. So we've got to make sure that we don't do that. So again, we're going to make sure we don't we let this down. So hang on one second. So we want this the Merrill pointing up, um, and then I'm I'm going to hold pressure here, and he's going to go ahead. So we're going to take very short, very sh short strokes. Is it not going in? Yeah. This sometimes is quite challenging. It goes a little tougher. Like a Python sheet, it's slightly better. Compared to comparatively, it's much better, but you need to apply a little pressure. So we're going to take short strokes. Because yeah. you don't want to kink the catheter that's going to Im impact us, right? Mm -hmm. Pan down, then lock the table. Release, release. OK. Good. So it's moving. I can feel the wire. It is tight, but it's moving. OK, there it released. It released. Okay. So pan up now, please. Let's see the wire in the LV. So let's stop there. So again, I'm making sure that I'm pointed up because this only flexes in one direction. Um, that I can, I'm not going to flex yet. He's going to. Now we're exiting the sheath here. So the valve is just exiting the sheath. Okay, st let's stop there. So you can go in LAO, but here the aorta is pretty well laid out. So we'll stay in this view. I'm going to start flexing. And, and the goal, again, off floor for a second. We have a minute. The pre so pressures are stable. We have about five, 10 minutes left in this transmission. So take our time here. The pressures, you know, any of these procedures, whether after the balloon, what I didn't mention is we always look at pressure. Sometimes you can create AR. And that tells you the pace at which you have to do this procedure. If the patient becomes hypotensive. You've got to start moving quickly. Here the goal is we see the calcium. We see the pigtail on the outer curve. Ideally, we don't want to scrape along that. So I'm going to start flexing now, um, try and come off. And see, it's coming off that outer curve. And it's a mixture of flex and holding rail on the wire. So I don't want to flex anymore because I'm off. Then I'm going to let him come up. And then I'm going to flex more, and I'm going to pull. Pull wire a little bit more. Oop, I think that's the limit. OK. So I'm going to pull a little wire. OK, stop. Let's get in our view before we cross. Portland. REO 12, caudal 16. Okay, mag up one, please. Double mag. Be ready for injections on the thing. T 10 for 10. Okay. okay. Center the table, please. Okay, go ahead and cross. Okay, so again, our pressure is okay. So t uh, can we do a 10 for 10 injection there? Let's do Cine when we're ready. Okay. How much? Ready? Sine? Inject. So it's probably a touch high, right? So we're going to go in just a hair. Ideally, we want that center marker about a millimeter above. 
Let's open back to pressure so we can see. Okay, go ahead and cross in a hair. Come back. No, no, in, in. What good, kind of foreshortening that's it, that's it, that's it, that's do you expect it. with this that's valve? That's good? So similar to Sapien 3, fairly full uh, for shortening and mostly from the ventricular side again, like Sapien 3. Okay, Sine. So I'm okay with that because we want to be a high deployment or you prefer a little bit further in? We can be like that. You like that? Okay. What about the panel? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think I would, I mean, I... Look, assuming that that's the central marker, it should be at the annulus. This looks like a good for a sort of an 80-20 implant. Okay, so we'll go here then. So we'll do a 10 for 15 for this next injection. Uh, and this will be under pacing and then on fluoro. So we'll do a store fluoro because I don't want the cine to cut out. Are you ready? Okay. Who's going to do pacing? Ready? Okay, perfect. Are you ready? Everyone good? Okay, P pacer on 180. Not, she's not pacing right now. There we go. Okay, in, inject. Inject. Inject, please. Okay, going up. Stay on pacing, stay on pacing. Don't turn pacing off. Okay, pace her back off. The floro. Okay, turn back to pressure. Help me out. We're going to come back. Good. Okay, pressure's recovering. Okay. Okay. Pressure's recovered. So, can we turn, get a look at the echo, or? Well, we're getting well. We're getting the echo ready. Maybe we'll do one injection. What do you guys think of the deployment? Let's play that deployment again, please. Okay. Yeah. You can see the force shortening really well in this deployment. You can see how the base. And it looks, but the top doesn't move at all, which is a really, really good sign. Uh, you didn't get much motion at all. I think your final implant is probably closer to an 80-20, um, and you can see no conduction change at all. Your hemodynamics look great. So overall, I think you're probably going to end up with a really good result. Be careful here. Just don't want to contaminate this. Yeah. Give me your towel, please. Give me just that. Yeah. If we can't get good views, maybe we'll do one aortogram, but go ahead and try for a second. We, I think we have five minutes left, so it's, we want to make sure we show the rest of it. Color the end. Color, color. Can we make the echo big on the transmission, please? Okay, that's fine. We can okay. see the echo. Yeah, yep. yeah it's so we, So is that mitral inflow or is that leak is the challenge here? It looks like a little bit of leak on the Legion mitral too. side, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's also where uh, your chunk of calcium is. Oh, yeah. yeah, fine. There's some leak. Well, let's do an aortogram here. Okay, come off, please. Can we do 15 for 20, fluoro? Can we ch go a little bit RAO? RAO. No, sorry, no, no, go back. And go a little more caudal. Right there, a little more. That's good, that's good. Okay. 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 Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay. Ready? 2015. Sine? So I, I would probably hit this once more. You guys agree? I do think so. I think okay. it's not just the wire. You have a little bit of PBL in addition to the wire. We look like it on echo, so I'll do one more. You know, I left about a half CC in or CC, and I'll try and give the rest, okay? Okay. Okay, I got wire. I got liquid, liquid, liquid. Okay, good. Keep going. A little bit more. Good, okay. So we're going to do another long pacing run. Okay, off Loro. Okay, pacer on 180. It's not okay. Sit in. Okay, that's fine. Keep going. Keep going. Don't say anything. Okay, pace her off. Okay, come on out, Laura. Okay. Okay, play that, please. So, so I, I with this interflator, it's hard to push. So I had to dial it in. 
but you do, you do see expansion, but then it recoils right back, right? Yeah. So hopefully we have some improvement, but this, this tells me we're at the limit of what we're going to accomplish because it's just it's recoiling from the anatomy. So I'm going to come back out. I don't think there's a need to do anything more. It's on negative. So I'm unflexing, taking the wire out. Where's the motor? Huh? Where's the motor? Yeah. I took it out. Okay, let's do one more injection here and see what we have, Floro. You want to square the valve up, uh, Sushil, yeah. so we can get a real touch, sense touch of Touch caudal. Touch, uh, yeah, let's do that. Touch more caudal. No, don't put down in the valve, because then it's Floro, 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 Floro. How's that? You guys okay there? That looks great. Okay. Let's do an injection here. Ready? Ready? 15 for 20, correct? I mean, it's very mild. Um, and again, I think this is the limit of what we can do in this anatomy. We have good flow in the coronaries, right? I think your hemodynamics are great. Your diastolic pressures are not bad. It clears with every beat. Yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, traced to mild AI. It's acceptable. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, that's another great demonstration, Sushil. I think uh, we are asking uh, ask to switch to another center. Sure. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Case. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Demonstration. Bye.